Hello viewers, welcome to Newspeak South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Release order of terrorist Omar Sheikh exposes Pakistan's commitment to end terror. Gulf targeting Indian Muslim youths to spread their violent agenda, NIA exposes dangerous nexus-based radicals. And target killings and assassinations continue to threaten Afghan peace process. Pakistan's kangaroo court has once again exposed the Pakistan's commitment to fight against terrorism. In a surprising move, Sindh High Court has ordered the immediate release of terrorist Omar Sheikh and American journalist Daniel Pearl murder case. A report. In the beginning of this century, a terrorist visual holding the severed head of a journalist was circulated widely. This heinous crime had made global headlines. Now the person responsible for kidnapping and killing of American journalist Daniel Pearl will be free to walk soon. Yes, this is possible in a country which is an epicenter of terrorism and where criminal justice system is inside the pocket of few individuals. In a surprise move, the Sindh High Court has ordered the immediate release of terrorist Omar Sheikh in American journalist Daniel Pearl's murder case. This was not the only case where the terror and criminal conspiracy of Sheikh was involved. A dropout of London School of Economics, this unordinary brutal terrorist was freed by the Indian government in 1999 during the exchange of the hijacked Air India flight and its passengers. I think this case it has been dragging on for so many years inside the, the court of Pakistan and there were lots of appeal to retain him inside the jails and by the parents of Daniel Pearl and also by the United States where there was lots of political pressure on Pakistan to continue keeping him inside the jail. However, releasing him at this time, it's absolutely a wrong message Pakistan is trying to give to the international community, especially at a time when Pakistan is already kept on the gray list and they needed to fulfill so many, more than 40 points to be removed from this list. So therefore, there will be an international pressure, especially from the United States and also from India, because involvement of this terrorist has been in India and he was released, in fact, on the basis of exchange after they hijacked the Indian Airlines and they took it to Kandahar. And I think everybody who lives in this South Asia understand that this kind of terrorist should be kept inside jail, no matter what may be the court of Pakistan may say. Because when you are a terrorist, you will remain as a terrorist. There is no question of being, being pardoned. He has to be kept under detention, even house detention, if he has to be released. And I think Pakistan has given the wrong message. In 2002, Pearl, the 38-year-old journalist of the Wall Street Journal South Asia Bureau, was abducted and beheaded while he was in Pakistan investigating a story of terror groups' links to Al-Qaeda. Sheikh was involved in the entire conspiracy. In April, a two-judge Sindh High Court bench had commuted the death sentence of Sheikh to seven years imprisonment and now the order of release has come. Experts have used that although America was willing to get the custody of Omar, but the ISI's close links with this terrorist provided him protection in the past years. I think America has been involved from day one. In fact, the American FBI team were in Pakistan even before he was arrested. And during his arrest, they were there. They interrogated him. There was a big team from the FBI and they have taken full uh, interrogation of uh, this uh, terrorist and his group and they have reached to a conclusion that he was part of the uh, group who has been uh, lured the, the journalist into their custody and then he was kidnapped and he was not aware of being killed but however he was part of a terrorist organization and these are the terrorist organization which comes again and showing that United States is more lenient in fighting terrorism because the selectivity of fighting terrorism does not apply 
to the South Asia or any terror organization. Terror is a terror. There is no question of a good terrorist or a bad terrorist. The United States understand the complication and implication of such policy. And I think now they are maybe more open to speak on these terms, but the United States could have taken this gentleman, this terrorist, into their custody, but they refused to do so because they said the local court in Pakistan is doing their job and he is under the Pakistani jurisdiction system. The decision by Sindh High Court has once again exposed the conditions of criminal justice system in Pakistan. This pro-terrorist ruling has justified the Pakistan's own ex-Prime Minister Shahid Khagan Abbasi's old statement that what is happening in Pakistan's court is a joke. Today, Omar Sheikh is free to walk not because Pakistan court wants to let him go, but because someone in Pakistan wants to see him free. And this someone is no other than the establishment which has time and again shown its sympathy towards terrorists in Pakistan. Gullibal Indian Muslim youths are the fresh recruitment targets of Gulf-based radicals. An extensive investigation by Indian agencies has unveiled a diabolic design that principally involves enticing these youths into relocating themselves to these countries under employment pretext and then radicalizing them for violence. Southern Indian towns and rural areas have been their prime picks. We have entire story for you. India, the origin country to largest number of professional migrants, is not just receiving huge remittances, but a complimentary, invisible, and rapidly expanding threat of terrorism too. The terrorist organizations, be it Islamic State or Pak-backed groups, who have failed to generate a radical impression in India, are systematically targeting Indian youths in other parts of the Muslim world. The findings of India's premier anti-terrorism agency, NIA, are worrying. A raid conducted recently in the southern India state of Kerala found that the Gulf operatives have already managed to make inroads into groups of semi-educated and gullible Muslim youths. And they have not just established a communication system, but a massive flow of information, both religious and radical, is being received and reciprocated. Recently, NIA has busted a linkage between seven Keralites and some terror organization, which were earlier linked with Al-Qaeda. It's also known that a fair amount of South Indians uh, have a diaspora in Gulf countries and certain other Islamic countries, and some of them may come in contact with the radicalized elements. The modus operandi has been simple. Mark those who are vulnerable, lure them into applying for Gulf-based employment, and then exploit their religious prejudices indoctrinate them with hate and launch them. These people are made to believe that they are a part of the larger cause of Ummah and their prime objective in this life is to ensure a global caliphate by all and every means. Criminal intimidation and coercion is applied to those who do not fall in line or try to back out after knowing the reality. These exercises have been in existence for a significant period of time but gained momentum especially after ISIS unleashed itself in early years of this century. However, more shocking is the fact that these radicals have managed to escape the law in these countries. Schools teaching hardline versions of Islam are not just growing in number, but they are openly advocating their inclination towards violence-oriented ambitions governments haven't cared. I think government is doing a fair amount of action uh, to investigate and bust out such linkages. And the fact that uh, these linkages are being highlighted time and again means that adequate efforts by intelligence agencies and security agencies are in place and being put in practice. The advent of the internet followed by social media has equipped them with a new arm. After upgrading the conventional platforms of madrasas and mosques, 
they have now tapped the potential of social media. They mislead you through disinformation campaigns and venomous literature. Law enforcement agencies concede that scrutiny and suspension of such proliferating social media accounts has become one of the biggest challenges for them. New Delhi is cracking down on operatives running these accounts and agencies have stepped up their investigation. They say, while this crime is stretching out, they are braced to take it head on and eliminate it. As intra-Afghan talks in Doha remain stalled, violence in Afghanistan has surged to new heights. While at one side, Afghan security forces are being targeted on a daily basis, journalists, lawmakers and doctors too are not safe in the country. Meanwhile, US top officials held separate meetings with Afghan government and the Taliban amid the bloodshed. This constant rise in violence mars the hopes for ending the war that has ravaged Afghanistan since the 2001 attacks on the United States. Already fragile health system of Afghanistan is facing a double setback amid COVID-19 crisis as its doctors and healthcare workers are being targeted continuously. Recently, a roadside bomb killed at least five prison doctors and health workers in Kabul while they were on their way to the country's largest jail, Bulir Charki prison. Three doctors, two of them women, were working to control the spread of the coronavirus in the jail. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the attack. However, Taliban clearly denied its involvement. Targeted killings of activists, journalists and government officials have been on the rise in Afghanistan to muzzle the voices of dissent and freedom. Recently, Afghan women's rights activist Freshta Kohistani was assassinated along with her brother by unknown gunmen in Kabisa province. The assassination comes a day after unknown gunmen killed Yusuf Rashid, CEO of Free and Fair Election Forum of Afghanistan in Kabul, along with his driver. Earlier, journalist Rahmatullah Nigsat was shot dead by unknown assailants in Afghanistan's central Ghazni province. The story of slain journalist is becoming all too familiar in the country. This is the fifth such murder in less than two months that shows how much unsafe the country has become for journalists. Since early November, a series of targeted armed attacks and bombings have claimed the lives of former Tolo News presenter Yama Shiawash, Radio Azadi reporter Elias Dei, Enikas TV anchor Malala Maiwand, and Ariana News presenter Fardeen Amini. This tactic uh, by the Taliban or the strategy adopted by the Taliban where it's targeting journalists, government officials and so on and so forth, I think has a multifold aim. First is to target all those who are creating a public opinion within Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan against the Taliban. So when you start targeting journalists, you create a climate of fear whereby nobody starts saying anything critical about the Taliban. The other part Targeting government servants is basically to paralyze the government. So once the government is paralyzed, it's unable to function. Chaos ensues and it is in this chaos that the Taliban hopes to make a comeback just as it did in 1996. Earlier, a car bombing in Kabul targeting an Afghan lawmaker killed at least nine people and wounded 20 others. Separate bombings were also reported in the provinces of Logar, Nangarhar, Helmand and Badakhshan, in which a number of civilians and security forces members were killed and injured. Afghanistan has seen a sharp rise in violence, particularly bombings, that too at a time when the country is trying to pursue peace. Most of the violence has been unleashed by the Taliban and they are hoping to gain an upper hand in talks by keeping the country on edge. The Afghan Interior Ministry in a statement said 
that the Taliban had killed at least 500 civilians and injured 1,050 others by carrying out 37 suicide attacks and 510 blasts across the country over the past three months. The Afghan government is pointing that out. Taliban, as of now, will not admit to it because they want to give the Americans a face saver. You see, if they said, yes, we are behind this particular violence, then the American claim that, you know, uh, the Taliban is not doing this becomes weaker and therefore it is difficult for them to get out of Afghanistan. So this is a fig leaf that Pakistan, the Taliban is maintaining before the international community to claim some semblance of responsibility. We know that they are responsible. We know who their backers are. The Afghan government know who their backers are. But given the international conditions where the major powers want to quit Afghanistan or at least want the Americans to quit Afghanistan, it is playing, so far it's been playing out very well for the Taliban that this fiction is not seriously contested by anybody. And I think this is to Afghanistan's detriment. Afghan authorities say that the Taliban, merely by denying their involvement in the recent targeted killings, must not be absolved from such acts. They have so far failed to define their Islamic political system and have the same views they had 25 years ago about women, arts, elections, freedom of speech and human rights. Afghans inside the country have been pushing to preserve the gains the country has made in its move towards democracy over the past two decades. The Taliban has said that they will agree to a ceasefire only with an agreement on the structure of the future political system. However, the Afghan government is insisting that a ceasefire be put in place before talking about the government structure. Since decades, Pakistan-based terrorists are wreaking havoc in Kashmir. Be it countless infiltration bids or terror attacks in Kashmir, Pakistan has been persistent on its efforts of disrupting peace and order in the valley. However, the Indian security forces, despite suffering losses, managed to foil all its devious agendas. Recently, proactive Indian defense has successfully busted terror modules of Park Bag Jashi Mohammed and Al Badr operating in Kashmir Valley. A report. In a major setback to Islamabad, Indian security forces recently gunned down two terrorists, including the one who was affiliated with proscribed terror outfit Jaish Muhammad. Based on specific inputs about terrorists hiding in the targeted area of the Baramulla district, a search operation was launched, during which terrorists fired upon the security forces, triggering an encounter. Earlier, another module of Pakistan backed Jaish Muhammad was busted and six terror associates were arrested involved in grenade lobbying incidents in Anantanag district of the Union Territory. The arrest came just after the terrorists launched a grenade attack on the Central Reserve Police Force personnel deployed in the region's Gandabal town, leaving three security personnel injured. Following the attack, security forces immediately cordoned off the area to nab the terrorists involved in the attack. All injured security personnel were rushed to a local hospital and were said to be out of danger. Here is our deployment of CRPF. We have a grenade lobbying from the park site. But three young people are injured. All those initial reports are minor injuries. But we have cut the area of the area. We are trying to get back to the area of the area. And we are trying to get back to the area of the area. The presence of Park back terrorists has been a major cause of concern for India as they continue to indoctrinate the local Kashmiri youth on the commands of Pakistani authorities who shelter the leadership of terror outfits in Kashmir as well as provide them with guidance, training and material support. However, these attempts of Pakistan seem to be failing badly as the number of Kashmiri youth joining terrorist ranks has dropped significantly and the ones who joined are now want to return back to normalcy on the path of humanity. Authorities say that as many as 12 terrorists have surrendered during live encounters with security forces this year. Recently, two local militants affiliated with Lashkar-e-Taiba, 
surrendered on appeal of families during the encounter with security forces in Kulgam. हमने सिलेंडर किया है अभी अभी हमने तांजेर और चांद्रा बोले मैं सिलेंडर किया देखो हम कैसे यहाँ पे मतलब अच्छी तरह से रखा है इन लोगों ने हम हमें यहाँ पे तो हम भी आप लोगों से गुजारिश करते हैं कि आप लोग वापस आ जाइए इस मतलब रास्ते से वो वापस आ जाइए ये गलत रास्ता है ये सही रास्ता नहीं है ये लोग हमें निकल 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 पाते हैं घर से फिर मरवाते हैं बीच रास्ते में ही While on one hand Pakistan talks big on crackdown on terror and peace in the region on the other the country is leaving no stone unturned to disrupt a flourishing grassroots democracy and development in Jammu and Kashmir however the successful conduct of the elections and the high voter turnout in Jammu and Kashmir are conveying the clear message to everyone including Pakistan that people of Jammu and Kashmir continue to favor democratic ways as they had done in 1947 when they opted for a democratic india and with that we come to the end of this edition of news week south asia we'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@nin.com this is shreya sabaje Signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.